Welcome all of you to this live program on orthopedic principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Alexander Lederman from Zurich, Switzerland. Dr. Lederman is a private docent at the University of Geneva. He's also the CEO of BMED. He's been the president of the Swiss Shoulder Society and also the president for the Foundation of Research and Training in Orthopedics. Dr. Lederman has been the chair of the membership committee and member of the central committee of the European Shoulder and Robust Society and also been a member of the central committee of the French Arthroscopy Society. Dr. Lederman has been the president of the Congress of the CISIC in Geneva in the past. If you notice, Dr. Lederman has delivered several lectures on our channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Dr. Alexander Lederman for this wonderful live program. OG Alex. Hello, Itesh. Thank you so much for the invitation. So yes, today we, we decided with Itesh that it could be interesting to talk about glenoid re reconstruction in reverse shoulder arthroplasty because we, um, we published some articles about this topic. And uh, interestingly, this uh, presentation will be a, a summarize of a chapter of book. So you have to know that I have conflict of interest. You could even say that I'm completely corrupted. However, I will try to remain as honest as possible. So as I said, this is a summary of a book that we are writing. I am the, the editor with Dr. Franceschi, Professor Atwal, and Giovannetti. Uh, and I wrote one of the chapter of this book with uh, Marco, with Patrick Donald, Philippe Collin. Uh, about different technique of glenary reconstruction, and this will be a, a summary. Um, so bone loss and cotroid is encountered in revision setting, but also in primary cases. And you will find bone loss in cofty arthropathy, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, but also simple conditions like instability, trauma, neoplasm, and even uh, congenital uh, malformations. And you will, uh, you will see some example um, in this presentation. The, the position and the fixation of the, of the base plate is absolutely critical for osseous integration, but also optimal range of motion and avoidance of instability and scapular notching. If you, don't, if you do not position well your base plate, you may, you may have a lot of serious problem. Interestingly, most studies focus on correction of glenoid version and inclination during reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And this is done nowadays based on 3D CT scan with a mean glenoid retroversion of six degrees and a mean inclination of seven degrees of superior tilt. But what is really important as well, it's not only the retroversion, the inclination, but also the medialization. And the, the joint line is usually nine millimeters lateral to the, the coacrete uh, process. So if you want to analyze exactly your medialization, you need to add to these nine millimeters the difference, meaning in this case, the lateral aspect of the base of the coracoid process, and then the deepest erosion of the glenoid. And you will have 20, 28 millimeters in the present case. If you add these nine millimeters, you, should, you have a rough estimation of what you need to correct. And this can be absolutely huge. Biomechanically, if you do not restore this joint line, you will have an altered deltoid and rotatocuff moment arms, uh, a reduced deltoid wrapping, and we, we learn during this last decade how this wrapping is important. You will, of course, modify the capsular tension and consequently, if you do not restore the joint line, we'll have implant malpositioning, and this will lead to impingement, instability, uh, loosening, and so on. Um, the bone in growth is necessary to have a stable fixation with time. And for this, you need to limit the micromotion of your base plate on the 150 um, micromillimeters. So it's, you, you, you can have 
a little uh, a little motion but it has to be really limited and the guidelines are at least 50 percent of base plate contact if you use a central screw and at least 55 percent if you use a central post and if you don't have these numbers if it's not attainable, then you should think about all the technique of reconstruction with more rimming, more grafting, and so on and so on. So keep this number in, uh, in mind. And finally, for bi biomechanics, of course, your base bit will be secure with screws. And there are three important messages. The first thing is your screw has to be long. So if you if you can even navigate them because you need to have at least seven millimeters of the screw into the bone they have to be large above 3.5 and i usually use in my practice 4.5 but if i have a bad bone quality i will even remove the eyelet of my base plate and try to introduce through the same hole 6.5 screws and your screws have to be divergent so this is some basic rules and then the post has to be in the native glenoid. You cannot, you can just not rely on the screw. So either the post or the central screw have to be in the native glenoid to obtain this famous initial stability and in growth. And interestingly, we said in the past that for revision cases, the post is the key because you won't have any in growth around um, the central screw, but at the end, it's not completely true for two reasons. First of all, the central screw provides a terrific compression, and compression is one of the key for uh, bone healing, first point. And the second point, and I think that this image illustrates quite well, if you have a central post, the, the, the in-growth potential is only a small ring uh, on several millimeters because the posterior wall is so thin that you won't have any bone in growth because you you your central posts will hardly touch this very thin layer so this is why i think that central screw is a very good, very elegant option in case of revision cases so what is the prevalence of the, the bone loss is present in 40% of our reverse short arthroplasty, so it's very high prevalence. And amongst them, uh, around 50%, so around half of these cases, will require some kind of bone grafting or metallic augmentation. Knowing that most of the case, the posterior bo uh, bone loss is the, the bone loss is posterior in around 20% of the case superior in around 10% of the case. And then we have few anterior cases, around 5%, and few boneless are global. And this is mainly the case in revision surgery. So what are the, the treatment options? So remember that the goal is to have a stable base plate fixation to achieve a serious integration. And then you need to Reapproximate the native glenoid joint line to achieve appropriate soft tissue tensioning. And what I think that you need to realize that we are not talking of, about bioRSA. BioRSA means bone increase offset. And we, we are not going to increase the offset with when we do glenoid reconstruction. We, we do bro RSA, it's bone restoration offset not more important concept so we can use the human head as an autograft uh, human head is i mean the most used for primary cases um, it's we we obtain and this has been published namely by pascal boileau very good result however from time to time you have this kind of images at five years the patient is doing perfectly well but you see that all the graft vanish. So I'm not saying that this is frequent, but you need to realize that we operate all patients that don't have always a very good bone and human head is not always uh, the key. So local autograft, use the human head. And what I do when I have a huge bone loss, I'm not going to graft only a small ring of bone. I'm going to graft the wall human head. So I prepare my glenoid, I prepare my human head, 
and then I craft everything because I really want to reconstruct all the granoid, not again just a small small wing. Um, for local autograft, I don't have any experience with distal clavicule, uh, and I'm not going to try because I will be afraid to destabilize the AC joint. We observe, uh, you know, a even fracture of the uh, of the clavicule in native situation without prosthesis. So if you remove the AC joint and then you implant a reverse, I will be really afraid to have a bad destabilization of the shoulder. Something that we, we just published, uh, I think last week, is the use of the correct read process. I'm sorry, it's it's written autograft, it, autograph, it's in French, it's of course autographed. Uh, and I think this is an interesting concept because it's local, and the correct process is usually uh, very strong, very, really hard ball. And you can use it in all directions. So meaning that you can, with this graph, reconstruct central bone loss. You can reconstruct anterior bone loss, like you will do during the Latarge procedure. And you can also reconstruct superior bone loss. So quite interesting uh, concept. And this is a um, short video illustrating how I, I use um, the coagulate process. So this was this is a revision surgery again. I remove um, so I think an eclipse prosthesis from our track. So I remove the the humeral part. I will prepare the the humerus. And when this is done, I expose the glenoid, remove the polyethylene, and then. When the glenoid exposure is done, I'm going to prepare all these areas, and you see that there is a mainly central defect in this case. So what I did, I just then harvested the coagulate process, exactly like uh, doing a latarge procedure. So you can use either an angulated saw if you want to go from medial, but you will see in another video that it's also very elegant to go from lateral. You don't need to do a decortication uh, because you want to keep this very strong bone. And then you transfer the coagulate process into the defect. Um, uh, at one of the keys to use a base plate that has a, a quite thin post, otherwise quite thin central post. Otherwise you may break the coagulate process and then temporary fixation. And then this is done, just impact um, your base plate or screw your base plate. Uh, depending on the technique that you are you are using. So quite elegant, and you see the conjoint tendon that is exiting inferiorly. We didn't observe any neurological lesions after this, uh, but and we hope that the conjoint tendon will have the same effect than um, for Latarge, meaning that it could even prevent uh, dislocation when your patient has the arm in abduction external rotation. And this is uh, the postoperative X-ray. So think about it, quite elegant technique. What about iliac crest bone graft? Uh, I use it mainly for revision surgery because I think that with the coagulate process, where I have enough bone for uh, with iliac crosses and the human head, I have enough bone for primary cases. Um, so this is uh, an example. Um, I implanted, uh, this is a personal disaster, I implanted this reverse short atroplasty in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Postoperatively, it looks quite nice, but you see that at six weeks, there is a super migration of the base plate. And this is a terrible case because they, there is really no more bone. Um, so I try to always plan these uh, cases to determine if uh, which which amount of bone I will need. And you, you can imagine that in this case, this is absolutely uh, massive. And I will show you the, yeah. So I think this is very interesting because there is no more bone. I mean, there is nothing left. It's just this small ring here. So there is no more posterior bone. And so this kind of revision is really difficult. So I decided, to try to fill this bone defect with uh, an iliac crest bone graft. And then I will add 
the coracoid process in the front and try to fix the posterior, uh, the iliac crest with the screw of my um, coracoid bone graft. So this was for the, the planification of this case. And this is what I did intraoperatively. So I harvested the three centimeter iliac crest and then used this uh, technique. So well, this time I cut the coagulate process from the lateral side. I just release the, the pec minor. And then this is the huge bone defect. So this is the only, only part of bone that remain. There was a huge hole here. And what I will do, I will fill this hole with the iliac crest and add my coagulate process anteriorly. So I fix things uh, with key wire. I fix a, a coagulate process in the front, and then I prepare my prosthesis. The central, in this case, the central uh, peg didn't have an unbelievable bite. However, I continue. Um, I continue the 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 reverse because I had two screws that had unbelievable bites. So the pay, uh, for for these difficult case, uh, cases, I always warn the patient that I may not finish in one step. However, if I feel comfortable during the surgery, I just continue, uh, and this is what I did. So this was for autograft, local autograft, and uh, iliac crest bone graft. Now let's move to allograft. That is another chapter. I think that the allograft has a huge advantage. This is the volume, the volume of bone that you can bring. However, there are significant disadvantages. And one of them is availability. It's not available in every country. This is something that you need to plan. You need to order it in advance. There is a, a huge cost. And this cost, this cost is almost prohibitive. And the last thing is um, I did some hip surgery before moving to shoulder. And there is one thing that I remember, just follow your patient enough. And when we use allograft with the hip, we observe acetular, uh, acetabular cup instability in 25% after two years. But this number rises to 50% after five years and 85% after 10 years. And for the best, to the best of my knowledge, all the series that we have regarding allograft don't have more than two years follow-up, or maybe slightly more. But I'm not going to use allograft until I will have huge series with more than 10 years of follow-up because I'm really afraid that exactly the same problem happened. So for the moment, I'm not using allograft on the glenoid side at all. Problem with bone is... Um, from time to time, the, the bone it's very good in the plate, but not bone, or, but the not all the the bone marrow is good in my patient. And we operate uh, old patients, and I from time to time ha have the impression to graft fatty osteoporotic bone, and I hate to be a, a fatty osteoporotic bone grafter. I hate this. Uh, and I, I will show you. I will show you this video. I think this is an interesting case. A patient that was uh, 51 years old. It's a glenoid dysplasia. There was more than 40 percent of glenoid retroversion. Um, so not not an easy case. And I plan for this patient to combine uh, a full wedge and uh, a bone graft. And I would like you to see what's happening when, so I, I prepare everything. Have a look to what's happening to this bone graft when I will screw my base plate. The bone graft will vanish. So even in, in a young patient that is 50, if you compress this bone, have a look. This is impressive. Everything is vanishing. Up. There is no more bone graft. So is the bone always the solution for these difficult cases? I don't know. 
uh, and from time to time, I'm quite afraid of this. So this is why more and more I'm using uh, metallic augmented base plate because it's ideal to correct almost all glenoid erosion. So if you have a superior inclination, FAVA E3, a Vanch P3, a C, just use, use a full wedge. If you have a FAVA E2, E4, uh, a Vanch P2 or a D, just use a half wedge. And if you have just a medialization, just use a, 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 a lateralization, a lateralized base plate, for example, like in Vanch A2. And the future is clearly this. So this is already on, on the US market. I think that the future is to stop to adapt the bone to the prosthesis, but is to adapt the prosthesis to the bone. And for me, this is the next step. So this is a uh, Bob gave, gave me this case. You have a posterior glenoid erosion, you plan your prosthesis, and then intraoperatively, your prosthesis just has the perfect shape of your bone, and you don't need to remove more bone to adapt the, the bone to your prosthesis. So clearly, the, this is the, the future. Uh, some people may be afraid of uh, integration. This is a courtesy of my colleague Gregory Cunningham, and you see that even if at the beginning of the posterior part you don't have a good contact with time, you will have a perfect posterior integration. And Finally, we published 18 months ago, a uh, combined graft. And I wrote the past because at that time, I didn't have navigation that changed my life. So a difficult case with a preoperative acromal fracture and almost no more glenoid. And what I did, so I cut a huge piece of human head to graft the human head. I fixed the, the spine of the scapula first and then did my reverse. So I prepare the, the, the glenoid, I graft all the human head, fix it temporarily with key wires. And then we see when this is done, you, uh, you need to be lucky because you don't have any more access to the glenoid. So you don't know what, you don't know exactly where your pin and your screw are going. But in this case, I have been lucky. So you just put on the graft, a full wedge because the, the, the goal is really to transform shear forces into compress, compressive forces. So I want to have an important inferior tilt in these cases, and this is um, what we, we obtain. So grafting, bone graft, full wedge on top of this, I add screws, then the, um, the glenosphere, and finally reduction, with already after the surgery a very good uh, for intraoperatively a good range of motion. And you will see the postoperative results. So I use a, a curve stem uh, in this case only system to obtain a little bit more naturalization. I have a significant inferior tilt uh, and I immobilize this patient for six weeks with this plane. And this is the two months postoperative range of motion. Uh, she already had uh, quite good anterior forward flexion for external rotation, external rotation, not yet, but it will come back with time. And this is uh, the two years result with a perfect in, uh, integration of the graft. And you see that I think that the addition of the full wedge, so of the metallic augmentation, also creates an inferior tilt that is important for compression and graft healing. Another case. So this is the, the six months and the, the two years postoperative result, almost no more glenoid. You graft all the, um, uh, the human head, you add a full wedge on top of this, and most of these patients will do absolutely well with time because you restore, maybe I, I didn't restore everything, all the lateralization in this case, but this is sufficient to have a correct postoperative range of motion. Anterior forward flexion is perfect for rotation. I agree, it's not unbelievable, but honestly, regarding the initial situation, very good, and the patient is absolutely satisfied. So another case, and this is, I think, the next step. I told you that 
previous cases were the past. This is the future. This is a locked entire dislocation. So you plan your case. Uh, and I also added bone plus metal in this case. So you plan your graft. This is the video of the surgery. So locked anterior dislocation with quite a huge bone loss. This is the planification. Um, again, I you cut the human head, prepare the, the stem in this case, short stem, and then I will expose the glenoid. And the remnant of bone is just this teeny part. This is the native glenoid. All this is a huge anterior bone loss. So I almost have, uh, don't, don't have any more uh, paleoglenoid. And then I navigate. And this is a game changer. Why? Because when you graft, you still know where you are, thanks to the navigation. So you can put all the bone between the, your paleoglenoid and um, you, you can put all the bone you want. You will still know exactly where you need to introduce your central screw, your central post, and also your screws because everything is navigated. So I have a perfect control of what I'm doing, even if I don't see anymore my paleo glenoid. And this is absolutely a game changer in my practice because this makes all the revisions, all the difficult cases are becoming easy thanks to this. Up, short stem, I repair the subscap, reduce the prosthesis, and you will see the postoperative x-rays. I saw the patient the other day, she's doing perfectly well. So this is for me the, the, the future difficult revision. The navigation helps you to know exactly where you are, even if you hide. Um, this is a six, uh, six weeks x-ray, postoperative x-ray. So a nice result. And this is the six weeks uh, CT scan as well. And you see that the implants are at the right position. So in conclusion, I think that you need to correct most deformities. You need to restore the joint line and to have a terrific primary fixation of your base plate. My goal is to transform shear forces into compressi compressive forces. And I, I obtain this thanks to um, a full wedge that I add on top of the uh, bony reconstruction. And I use very often metal in my hands. And another take home message, you can rely on bone, but all, not all the bar, the bone. So uh, I really like, so, you know, some like, like it when it's uh, soft. I really like it when it's, when it's hard. So eat the fat, implant metal. Um, and so for me, my algorithm is for primary cases, human head and eventually metallic augment. In revision with moderate defect, I use the crack rate process uh, and metallic augment. And then with severe defect, iliac crest, bone graft, eventually crack rate process and a metallic augment. And um, Dash told you I am the, the founder of uh, a BMED. I'm just showing you this because I think this is a very important message. When I have, when I had in the past difficult cases, I had to go to Lyon once per week, take my car, take uh, my difficult case, present them to Gilles, and I was going back home. And today we have this kind of nice software that allows you to uh, show your difficult cases. And the day after, you have at least six, eight key opinion leaders in the world that give you your opinion about this particular difficult case. And this allowed you to do a synthesis and I think to treat better your patient. Thank you, Imash. I'm finished. Itesh, I'm finished. Thank you, Alex. Alex, you can stop sharing. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Alex, for yet another brilliant presentation. And congratulations that BMED has grown and has now surgeons from around the world, I mean, getting opinions and giving opinions. Share knowledge, the key. Okay, uh, Alex, uh, see now you have described about this technique, like use of the coracoid to bridge the defects inside the glenoid. Now, you have one of the first people who also described the dynamic anterior stabilization. So, 
are you going to rename this procedure as dynamic shoulder arthroplasty, where you're using the coracoid with the <laughs> biceps? Okay, so this is a very good comment. Uh, we, we, we did a good job with the dynamic anterior stabilization because uh, we and other groups succeeded to prove that there is uh, bio, biomechanically, uh, th there is a huge effect with the uh, long hand of the biceps. To be completely honest, we had this idea with the cricoid process. Um, then it's only a theory. In theory, the, when you put your arm in abduction external rotation, this could prevent uh, dislocation. But I cannot prove it yet because no study has been has been done, and I have a, a limited a limited experience. But it's a very good remark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Alex, uh, also, you know, when you consider putting the coracoid, is there any area where you should not keep it? For example, you have said anterior glenoid loss, central, inferior. Is there any location where you are not supposed to use the coracoid? Yes. So I think it's impossible to use posteriorly due to the conjunct tendon because we keep the conjunct tendon. Uh, and uh, you cannot use it if you cannot use it vertically, so for superior boneless, if you still have a subscapularis. So if if you repair the subscap or if you, if you still have a subscapularis, I think you, you cannot use it horizontally because you will have an impingement between the conjunct tendon and the subscap. Alex, and also one of the best advantages of using this particular technique is it provides us a dynamic sling effect, right? And you cannot repair the subscapularis. That, that is the uh, unique advantage, isn't it? I think so. Yes, the, this is something quite interesting. You know, the, there is another important point that I didn't have time to mention, but I think that anterior impingement is an underreported complication. And to cutting the Cutting the pec minor might my, my avoid postoperative um, scapular dyskinesis. And then uh, to not to have the conjunct tendon in front of the of the, the shoulder may have may also avoid some kind of anterior impingement. So this is another other advantage of this uh, this procedure. Thank you, Alex. And Alex, what about graft resorption? When we talk about in general, in shoulder instability surgery, we talk about graft resorption, the Wolf's law, the graft has to be loaded, otherwise it's going to get resorbed, right? So does it apply for shoulder arthroplasty as well? Uh, correct. And I'm pretty sure that uh, it, it applies, but less with autograft than with allograft. And this is why I'm really afraid of allograft due to long-term resorption. I'm really afraid of this. Thank you, Alex. Alex, just one last question before I end of the session. Alex, do you think additional screw fixation into the acromion clavicle or the coracoid in general for a revision shoulder arthroplasty works? Do you, do you get some kind of kickstand screws? Like how we say in the acetabulum, we put screws in the ischia. Yes, yeah, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think that navigation in the future, if you can navigate your screw, you will, by definition, have better bite because you know exactly where is the bone. Um, so I try it for every single revision, for, for every single difficult case to navigate these cases. And then if you have a custom prosthesis, of, co of course, you will have the possibility to uh, reach all the bones that you mentioned to obtain a better fixation. So yes. Thank you, Alex. Alex, uh, that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another amazing presentation. And I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Hitesh, and see you soon. Bye-bye.